Hello, healthy person, healthy human being and citizen of planet Earth. Welcome back to another episode of the Alter Your Health podcast, your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Alter. Thank you so, so, so very, very much for being with me spending this hour with me and i do hope you spend the whole hour with me because it's an hour it would be it will be an hour well spent and if it's your first time stopping in hey nice to connect i'm glad you found me and if you would be so kind before you go just hit a subscribe hit a rate and review this podcast or leave a comment provide some feedback wherever you're tuning in from i do truly appreciate it and Definitely, definitely appreciate that feedback. Always take it to heart. And really my intention is to continue growing, evolving, expanding into the world, and and really just with the intention of providing high-level information that not only informs individuals like you, but inspires, because that's what it's all about. We've got enough information, and sometimes we need a little boost of inspiration. So I like to blend the two of those things in this podcast. And the intention is to empower you to live your best life. And I am confident, totally confident that today's episode will provide that inspiration and information to boost you along your healing journey. So if you love this kind of stuff, also feel free to share it with a loved one. Just send it off in an email, a text, or even a face-to-face conversation. Hey, buddy. Hey, Joey. I listened to this great podcast with this guy. His name was, what was it? Dr. Benjamin Alter. He was talking to this other cool guy. What was his name? Howard Jacobson. Yep, Howard Jacobson is the guest of the podcast this week. Do you know Howard Jacobson? You might have seen his name. You might have heard his podcast even. But do you know his story? In this episode, we dive into the story of Howard Jacobson and how he went from uh, I don't know, I guess you would say just just some random guy. He's still a random guy. We're all random people, right? But he went from a random guy to a co-author of what is, in my humble opinion, the best book on nutrition that exists. And that book is Whole, written by Colin Campbell. But if you look on the cover of that book, Whole, that has sold probably a lot of copies around the world, under T. Colin Campbell, you will see Howard Jacobson, PhD. And we'll talk about in this conversation how Howard Jacobson went from just some random guy to being on the, the, the cover of that book. And, and then obviously what that has done for his life and his career and his health and his well-being. So it's really a phenomenal conversation. I really do appreciate it. I loved hearing his story. And I also loved hearing some really rich pearls when it comes to understanding how to emerge into the world in our healthiest most authentic way because not only has howard written co-authored a numerous amount of books um, with all sorts of individuals such as sick to fit with josh lajani whole of course with t colin campbell proteinaholic with garth davis he's a co-author you guys he's good at that kind of stuff Um, but not only is he a co-author he is the co-founder and educator and chief behavioral science scientists i guess you could say at well start health which is a digital therapeutics platform and care team dedicated to putting chronic disease out of business and one of his missions is his goals is shaking up healthcare so that's exactly what he's doing with his high performance health coaching and he's coaching coaches on how to help transform individuals lives all across the globe so we kind of got into some psychology i guess you could say around high performance coaching and really how to see things through a lens that allows us to move into challenges and through challenges within a way that really just promotes success and promotes overall well-being because it's one thing to just eat healthfully and choose the right foods but it's quite another thing to feel good and to be aligned throughout that journey, throughout that process. So Howard Jacobson, wonderful human being. He does have his podcast as well. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called the Plant Yourself Podcast. 
It's been out there for much longer than my podcast has. He uh, He's kind of a podcast role model, I would say. Um, so anyways, I've been blabbering for quite a bit. I usually don't blabber this long, but apparently I just wanted to blabber about myself and Howard Jacobson. But before we dive into this episode, you guys, I just have to sprinkle in a little more information about who I am and one of my offerings that I'm extremely enthusiastic about nowadays, and that is the healing community that we offer at Alter Health. So the Alter Health healing community is a space where like-minded, like-hearted, self-healing individuals like you and me come together and we meet online once a week and we share what's going on. We share questions and we discuss topics from all ranges of plant-based nutrition, other aspects of healthy living, all the way into mindset, motivation, mind-body connection stuff, which in my opinion is really the the most empowering and richest and you know the the greatest source of leverage that we have when it comes to shifting our experience in this physical life, shifting our health inwardly and outwardly. So that's what I'm really enthusiastic about the Alter Health Healing Community. You can find out more at www.alter.health and slash healing dash community if you want to land directly on that page. And we're offering a two week free trial for people who want to hop into the next two weeks of community meetings and give it a try see if you enjoy and all of the meetings are of course recorded archived and you can go back in time and listen to all the good stuff as well anyways enough is enough is enough let's sit back and relax or continue your morning commute or your jog or whatever you're doing but bring some mindfulness to your practice to your life and open up your ears open up your hearts take a breath exhale and enjoy this rich and meaningful conversation that traverses all sorts of fantastic stuff with Howard Jacobson. All right, Dr. Howard Jacobson, thank you so much for being a guest on the Alter Your Health podcast. Uh, it's an honor. Happy to be here. Well, it's an honor for me. You are a, a longtime podcaster in this health wellness specifically, I guess you could say, plant-based space. And uh, when exactly did you start your podcast? I'm not really sure. <laughs> uh, I kind of started it without a plan. And so I just started interviewing people and just posting them. I didn't really know much about podcasting, but I was just sort of like posting MP3s. And I got serious uh, when I was on Rich Roll's podcast. And I said, yeah, I do a bunch of interviews. And he said, really, how many? I said, well, I've got about 30. So where are they? Well, here and there. He's like, dude, get serious. So th that was like March of 2014 when he told, you know, and he then sent me like all this material. Like he said, this is everything I used when I started. So I figured, well, he oh. probably knows what he's talking about. Yeah, you got a little push from Rich Roll. That's cool. So he was the inspiration. So I can say I've been doing it consciously since 2014. Okay, very cool. Um, yeah, kind of before podcasts were cool. At least cool in, in my perspective, or for my vision, I really only started listening in about 2017. Yeah, uh, I guess I guess up until then I was too busy in school See, and stuff. Yeah. See, I think they were cooler before. I think now now that you know all the all the kids are doing them, they're not as you know. It's, it's so true. All the little kids <laughs> like me. <laughs> but anyways, thanks for thanks for uh, playing with me in the in the playground. Well, I sound like an asshole, don't I? <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, take me there <laughs> take, take you to your inner asshole <laughs> no we'll, we'll avoid that we'll avoid that trajectory of the conversation but anyways i you know you you you're not a new kid on the block you're not a new kid on the block like i'm i'm obviously more of a new kid on the block um so i i feel grateful to connect with a you know a, a mentor or a or a, a role model i guess i could say and uh how how did you get here how did you get here and now? I mean, what, what has your path been like? I know you uh, have an MPH and a PhD in health sciences and uh, have like, was is from the moment you were born where you just, was this your trajectory or what were some defining moments that have guided you along your path in this health world? Yeah, no, I, I, I would have been the left fielder for the New York Yankees had things worked out. <laughs> Um, so no, this is, this is, this has all been just like one accident after another. Um, I, um, I was a school teacher 
for many years. Mm. And the reason I was a school teacher, partly I love teaching and partly I was scared of adults. So like school felt like, you know, crawling back into the womb. <laughs> like I, I knew how that worked and I didn't, I didn't actually know how the, the world of adults worked and like business and things like that. So I just, I was a school teacher for a long time and uh, I got a job out of college at a private school, very, very sort of fancy private prep school. And I was teaching like middle school world cultures. So, you know, I'd gotten a history degree in college. So I, was, I was felt pretty good about that. But they also needed me to do an, ath an athletic thing. And they made me the um, third offensive line coach for the JV football team, um, which I can't, I can't think of eight things I'd be less qualified for in the world. <laughs> But, but, but there I was, and but, but fortunately, before I could start coaching, uh, they had a, they had an away game. I think they played their away games on Fridays, um, and it was a Jewish holiday, so I didn't accompany the team. And when I when I got back to work on Monday, I discovered that not only the team had the team lost, but they had been very poor sports and had mooned the other team leaving the parking lot, and cast such a pall on the good name of our school that the team was disbanded. And so I had this group of kids that I now had to deal with as a PE coach because now they weren't going to do football practices. And what I and a lot of these kids had been in my classes and were sort of so-so students of academic discipline, but I started seeing like a, like a whole bunch of like brilliance in physicality. Like, and and I, was, I was like, I could reach these kids in a completely different way. And up to then, I'd been like an egghead. Like, the, you know, the, the world of the intellect is what matters. And the, our bodies are just sort of there to carry our heads around. And having being forced to do this, to interact with these kids, I started like, I taught them ultimate Frisbee. And I started seeing like the difference between just like PE, like let's play sports versus let's learn about our bodies and make them healthy. Like I got much more into that than the world cultures I was teaching. And that kind of led me on this trajectory to want to go back to school um, for health education, to learn how to help people value their bodies. Because I saw for, for most people, like I was one of the 3% of people who like school was built for me, <laughs> right? Like I'm really good with a number two pencil. I can fill in all the right circles. <laughs> I see, yeah. But most most people, you know, they're they're built for other things in life rather than, rather than school. And I and as I as I saw the value in that, I wanted to grow my own horizons and turn into that sort of person. So I went to school for health education. Um, took me six years to uh, to get my PhD. And the only reason it only took me six years is that after five years they sent me a letter that uh, in academic speak basically said shit or get off the pot. Um, so, so I, I did a crappy dissertation, got my degree, and then tr I didn't want to be a professor, like re doing research never interested me. I thought like there's other people who can, who are good at finding things out. I kind of just want to take what is known and empower people with it and couldn't find a job outside of, of academia. I, um, I, you know, I just didn't know anything about the world of business. And so then through, through a friend, I found my way into the business world and completely forgot about the health stuff for about 12 years. What was that way into the business world through which you dropped everything you knew regarding health? Well, so it was from um, one of my best friends, Peter Bregman, whom I didn't know very well at the time. And I have to say, so for, in term, for, for context, uh, Peter is, um, he runs Bregman Partners, and he's developed all this really innovative and wickedly effective coaching methodology, which I have shamelessly stolen and adapted for, for, for health coaching. So that's, that's where I get all that. But Peter, Peter at that point was interested. He was doing organization development through coaching, leadership development. And he was interested in the body, which was something that wasn't really part of the conversation in, on like Wall Street, where, where he had clients. Like, yeah, so, so his clients were business, finance, that level of thing, you know, yeah. not, not health. 
Right, right. So just helping organizations be more effective, helping them navigate changes. And he saw that he saw the uh, an obstacle to change was people's bodies. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right? They weren't in touch with them. They would get angry, like whatever, whatever they had to do involved some, it involved their bodies and business and, you know, body's not important, right? It's you mean, so you mean like people didn't feel good in their body, so they weren't able to do good business? Partly that, but partly that they were, that their, their bodies were these sensitively tuned instruments that were saying no to things. You know how like your uh -huh. mind can say theoretically, yes, I'd like to do that. And the body goes, hell no. Got it. Yeah. I, like, I, I, you know, I should have this difficult conversation with someone. Like I understand that there's a, there's a value in that. Uh -huh. And then like the feeling that I get in my gut is I'd rather die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like the, the battle between you know, what the, the, the language that I use is like the authentic self and the ego or the intellect and the divine wisdom. Yeah, yeah. So there's, believe me, there's a lot of ego and intellect yeah. um, in, in corporate America and in New York City. And this was around, you know, 1999. And there wasn't a lot of um, conscious connection to divine wisdom. Yeah. Right. If you if you read all their um, annual reports and you you wouldn't you wouldn't see the word divine <laughs> men mentioned a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, the, it's a different world. Uh, so so you um, so you connected with this coach and got into kind of corporate financial kind of coaching consulting. Yeah. Stuff? Well, actually, he he explained coaching to me, which I had never heard of before, other than you know football coaching. But like, you know, business coaching, performance coaching, life coaching. And I got really excited about it. And, and he'd been working on an article for a newsletter. And he sent it to me to help me understand. The article wasn't finished, but I finished it for him. I was like, oh, my God, this is the best thing ever. Because my dissertation had been essentially about a change effort that, that had failed. Like I got great results for about six weeks while I was doing it. And then I did follow up. And I noticed that the day I left... It's as if everything I had done had been a sandcastle. And one wave came and like nobody remembered anything about it. It was a stress management intervention in uh, a bunch of schools. And so I, I had that question in my mind already, like how do you make change stick? How do you make it stick for individuals and how do you change organizations? And here he was with this elegant answer in the, in the form of a methodology I'd never heard of. So I just finished his article for him. I'm like, oh my God. And I sent it back and he's like, you know, I could use a director of marketing. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what's marketing? And he said, <laughs> we're smart guys, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and that was my entry to the world of business. And that's where I stayed um, pretty much exclusively until 2011. Wow. Okay. Amazing. And so 2011, what happened in 2011? In 2011, I got an email from Colin Campbell asking if I would help him edit a bunch of chapters into a, a book. Where the heck did that come from? I mean, I, mean I, wanted to, I wanted to understand the connection with, you know, it's like, I guess there's been this writer inside of you that's, you know, expressing in different ways, shapes and forms. But yeah, how, how yeah. the heck did that happen? Like, yeah, well, well, it almost was an accident. He, he, once, he once sent me- Wrong Howard Jacobson. Well, there's, there's, <laughs> my, my middle name is Michael. There's a Michael Jacobson who runs like the Center for Science and the Public Interest. So I think there was a confusion about that at some point. But, but at this point, no, he, it was the right Howard <laughs> Jacobson. I was, I was still fiercely interested in health. And in 2004, I read the China study. Hmm. Um, and it came out in December 2004, and I wrote an Amazon review uh, for it. That was I wrote it about five weeks after publication, and it was the third review on Amazon for the book, which which tells you something about how unknown the book was. It was yeah. Well, it's funny because I didn't know obviously didn't know about it in 2004, um, but I know that now it's prolific and everyone knows about it. Yeah, it's, it, it, it started slow. <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll see. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it was rejected by every publisher except Ben Bella, the one that eventually took it on. At that point, I think Ben Bella had mostly been young adult, like vampire fiction. So, <laughs> so they took a bit of a risk. Because <laughs> uh, the vampire books, I do not believe, were plant-based. No. 
So you so, wrote an Amazon review that five weeks after publication, it was the third review on Amazon. Yeah. Right. And, and the reason that's significant is that, yeah. you know, you can vote reviews up or down. Was this helpful? And so the ones you see are the ones you tend to vote on. So somebody new comes to the site, reads the review and votes. So if it's in the top three, it gets voted up. And it was a long review and I used lots of big words. And so it quickly rose to the top. And I didn't think anything of it. And believe me, I had no ulterior motives in writing an Amazon review for a book by an unknown author whom yeah. I would, you know. But what then happened was that Amazon, the Amazon page for the China study became ground zero for a, a huge and nasty fight. Oh, wow. Um, it, it became, as, as the book started gaining um, some prominence and people started hearing about it, uh, it became the place where the members of the, uh, what's his name, the Weston Price Foundation people, Weston A. Price Foundation people would come and post slurs, then very sort of ad hominem attacks and very nasty and saying like he's part of the vegan mafia and posting all sorts of lies about his business interests. And it got, it got very ugly. And I didn't know about any of this because I wasn't like going back to the page to like, you know, see how many people liked my review or anything. I just had forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. But unbeknownst to me, this my review would constantly be flipped back up to the top and push all these other ones down. And so Colin got this idea in his head like that my review is some sort of a shield. <laughs> right. So he found me and he called me. And this would have been like a year after the review, sometime like 2005 or something. Um, 2006, maybe. And he said, are you the guy who wrote that review? I'm like, yeah, be dark, you can do it. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I just, I utterly fanboyed on him. Like, I'm on the phone with Colin Campbell. This guy should win a Nobel Prize. Holy shit. Yeah. And it turns out he, he, they, they were living in Ithaca and we were going to be going up to, a, to an event by the Finger Lakes. So we arranged to meet and we met. And at that point, I was able to you know, put together words and sentences and our families hit it off. And I think at that point, he always thought of me as a writer because I wrote the review. <laughs> <laughs> if he can write a review, he can help me write a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I had written um, a couple of manuscripts before that. The, the main one that anyone knew about was um, a dummies book on, uh, on how to advertise on Google. You mean like dummies like advertising for dummies kind of thing is that what you mean yeah like okay oh wow so, so you so this was before when was oh wow when was this one published this one i want to say 2007 i okay. think it came out so like when i say i spent 11 years in the you know 12 years in the business world like i was like all in wow. like doing stuff and <laughs> And so when I got this call in 2011, like I had, a, I had a, an advertising agency, um, you know, it, it, made, it made no sense to say yes. Um, so of course I did. It, wait, what was the call in 2011? That was, um, you know, do you want to help me write this book? Oh, that was the call from Colin Campbell, but he called you. But, but he called you before in 2006. Yeah, we, that's, when we, that's when we became friends, like 2005. And so, you know, we, and then he, he, you know, had a, his family was in North Carolina. So, and then he bought, he had a house in Durham. So we would, we would get together occasionally. Okay. Um, so, we, you know, yes. we'd, so by the time, you know, he had this uh, manuscript together in 2011, um, I had this other career. And I, I basically jettisoned it for the chance to work with him. Wow. So you gave that up and you kind of dove all in to plant-based authorship. Yeah. I mean, I gave, I gave up, you know, it wasn't, I, you know, I, I still paid bills. Um, I had a partner in the agency whom I made do, a, you know, she had to do a lot more work after I kind of checked out emotionally. But the truth was I, I never should have been in marketing. Um, it, it was never a passion. I was, you know, I was good at it in a certain way. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my contribution it, to the world. It, that, that being said, it seems like it, 
probably provided some good knowledge and skills to move yourself forward in this new direction, I would imagine. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. It's, not, it's not an experience that I wish I hadn't had. Right. Um, it's an experience that I was wishing I wasn't having at the time. Yeah. So 2011, you were called again by Colin Campbell. And it was like, will you help me write this book whole? And you were like, yeah, let's do this. So yeah. From that point forward, what, what was that relationship like? I mean, I, what is it like to co-author a book? Because yeah, well, you had the manuscript and you were just kind of refining it or, or what well, was it we like? Didn't, we didn't know. He thought he had 19 chapters mm -hmm. and he thought he just wanted them cleaned up. And so it became clear to me that because he'd written them over like a four year period, that, you know, chapter 17 was almost the same as chapter 11. He hadn't quite, you know, he hadn't, hadn't really put them together, that there were, th but, th but I kept on, I was, we were living in South Africa. Um, so my wife is from there and we, you know, we'd spent, you know, 20 years uh, living among my people and it was only fair for me to spend a year <laughs> living among hers. So we were living in this rural village, um, uh, about you know two hours away from a supermarket um, oh, wow. so we had i didn't ha you know he sent me the i had a you know internet and a laptop but he sent me these chapters i had to like print them in order to to edit which meant i had to go find a printer and the only ink that i could find in this in this big city peter maritzburg which has like a big mall and it had the movie theater and everything was blue ink <laughs> So I had the first thing I had to do was go and, you know, open all of his documents and change the font color to blue. So it would print. Hmm. And, and we couldn't, you know, we, we, we didn't really talk on the phone. It was almost entirely via email. So mm -hmm. I, I would say my experience of co-authorship is different than <laughs> what, what you normally What's expect. typical. Yeah, yours was in uh, South Africa with blue ink. But backing up a little bit, I, ju I just realized, like, you know, when in this health journey were you bit by the plant-based bug? Was it reading the China study or was it um, at a, before then or after then? Yeah, so this is an embarrassing question <laughs> because, uh -oh. because I was bitten three times before it took. The first one was in 1990. Right after my dad had died of a heart attack, I was 25, and I found John Robbins' Diet for a New America, and immediately shifted to, I guess, you know, whole food plant-based, although I don't think the word really existed, at least certainly not in my uh, consciousness. But, you know, I stopped sugar, and I just stopped eating all meat, and basically, you know, very little oil, and I lost all this weight. I was able to fit into size 31 jeans. And it was just amazing. And everything he said made sense. And then like six years later, it's, it's as if it hadn't happened. Like I completely forgot, like somehow life intervened and, and nothing that he had said had any impact on my life at all. So six years later, did it slowly deteriorate or did something happen six years and it was like, ah, oh, the hell with it? No, no, it's, I didn't even notice. You just slowly drifted back into standard America land? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason I know in 1996 that it was there was that that was the year my daughter was born, first child. And so I remember, like, when she went on solid foods, we'd buy all this, like, you know, happy cow chocolate yogurts. And she loved chicken nuggets. And I would, you know, I would be, you know, she was, she was a, a feisty child so any like anything we could do to get her to not be upset we would do um which i don't recommend as a parenting strategy by the way um but like i'd you know go out 11 o'clock at night to get chicken nuggets um i remember when she was like a year and a half old i was admonishing her to not scrape the cheese off her pizza like it's it's it's, it's as if i don't know it's just this other this other life that had, had no bearing and then in 2004 with the China study. And then we were, you know, in South Africa, there's, it's hard to get fresh fruits and vegetables. And I was like justifying all sorts of stuff. And I was kind of back to eating meat and I'd read wheat belly and I didn't have any capacity to judge the claims or the, you know, look up the studies. I didn't know about kind of doing my own research. 
And so I'm like, geez, this makes sense. So you read the China study and you dove into that, you bit that hook. <laughs> and then you also bit the wheat belly hook. And obviously, like, and I, I don't know, I think a lot of us are grabbing onto whatever we can if we're in a place of uncertainty with regard to food. But, but, you, but it sounded like there was, I guess what I'm pointing out, there, there was health conscious in, you know, in health consciousness inside of you that was trying to make the best decisions most of the time. Yeah, as long as it's, you know, didn't hurt too much or didn't interfere with my life. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say I was quite asleep for, for a lot of that time. And I would yeah, I get, I was interested in health and I wanted to be healthy and I would do things for a while, but I did not know how to sustain habits when things got difficult. So I've had meditation habits, uh, breath work habits, running habits, yoga habits, journaling habits that all sort of like, again, like the John Robbins thing, they just sort of went away without me even noticing. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of, I kind of got this narrative like, well, I don't stick with things. Mm -hmm. um, but then, I mean, what changed was like when, when Colin asked me if I would help him with the book, I was like, sure. Jeez, I better stop eating mutton. <laughs> <laughs> did he know? I mean, did that come up? I'm just curious. No, no, <laughs> I wasn't going to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll do it just as long as I can also do this. But no, just kidding. But um, yeah. well, no. I mean, that was the thing I realized when I started like working and I shifted again. It's like, well, I shouldn't eat that way. I'm working on this book now, and that again, I did not have the capacity to make my own decisions. Mm -hmm. That I was just I was basically guru shopping. Mm -hmm. And Colin Campbell's a really good guru, but you know, William Davis makes a lot of sense, and. Uh, that, that lady, Denise Minger, wrote that really long blog post. She looks like she knows what she's talking about. And, yeah. You know, and they, she's cute, too. And, you know. <laughs> like, in Colin Campbell? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our types. <laughs> um, but I realized that, you know, that basically I was choosing whoever I thought was, like, charismatic as opposed to who was right. And... Uh. And working on whole, like one of the things, the gifts that he gave me was he shared the research and he said, like, what do you, you know, what do you think of this? I wasn't just wordsmithing after a while. We were actually like, he, there's a lot of hard science in that book in whole. Mm -hmm. And I know it's hard science because it was hard for me. And there were, there were chapters that took me six weeks just to understand. Wow. <laughs> right. Like I mean, the one, well, yeah, just to pause you for a second on whole. Literally, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to suppress my inner fanboy because to me, that is the best nutrition book of all time. If I, if anyone ever asks, like, what nutrition book do you recommend? Broadly speaking, that covers everything. You read that, you don't have to read anything ever again. Just, oh. you know. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's the, the top book in all of the nutrition world. And I've heard a lot of people agree with me on that. And I can really appreciate how you know, here, I, I, I just freaking, you know, listen to it on Audible, you know, I, uh -huh. you, you were immersed into it, your hands into it, you were living it. So I could imagine how that level of immersion into the plant based science, it was like, yeah, there was no going back. It was very clear for you, I'm sure after and through that. Yeah, because, you know, I struggled with it. So I had, I had like skin in the game. And I had, I, for the first time, I had proof. That it, you know, that there, there, was, there was a rootedness to my knowing now that was different. So like for a while I was telling people like, you know, how do you change your behavior? Write a book with Colin Campbell. Like that's my recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the only or, thing for me. Yeah, leave a really long Google or Amazon review and then wait a couple of years and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, like, it's like those, uh, those folk tales of like the, you know, the third son goes and tries to do what the other ones have done. <laughs> Yeah, well, what an amazing story of how it kind of wove you into this. And anyways, kind of like fast forwarding, I guess. Here you are, you, you did a real seemingly dramatic career change, dove into co-authoring this phenomenal book on plant-based nutrition. And then it seemed like that kind of opened up doorways and gateways into other things in the world of uh, plant-based health and nutrition, right? Yeah, well, what really opened it up was, was Colin's generosity. So, you know, he put me on the cover, which he could easily yeah. have, have not done. 
And he then like reached out to everyone, all the VegFest organizers and said, uh, you know, Howie's a good speaker. You should really get him to come talk. And that kind of gave me some, expo a lot of exposure. Yeah. Uh, I met a lot of, you know, my heroes. Like, I mean, totally. just- Yeah, that's awesome. You've had Colin Campbell as a little cheerleader and you had Rich Roll as a cheerleader. You've, you've got some good supportive figures in your life. Yeah, it was, it was so- unreal to the, to to go to these places and like there's Hans Deal and he like he knows who I am because of Hole and Joel Furman and Chef AJ and McDougal and like all of a sudden like these people I have their cookbooks I've been following them and all of a sudden like I'm sort of their equal in some weird professional way. It's just you yeah. know I'm sure I'm sure I was very goofy about it. Yeah, it's like you it's like you entered this teleporter device that was co-authoring the book and then it brought you into this new world it's a yeah yeah and so and so that's when i started doing these interviews even before before you know i had the 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 whole podcast thing nailed down i just mm -hmm. i mean the first thing the reason i started the podcast is that i wanted to have a conversation with john robbins and so he was like the 31st person that I interviewed. I, th I think I think subconsciously because of you know the 31 flavors or something. <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to have a, a a body of work so that I could approach him and say, "Hey, I've got this podcast. I'd love to talk to you." And and really, that's what it has been the entire time. Is like, who do I want to talk to? Who who's going to be a fun conversation? Well, I'm gl I'm glad to have recently had the opportunity to have a fun conversation on your podcast and and yeah, it seems like it has been evolving over the course of these last 5 years or so. Yeah, and again, you know, like one of the things I realize, like the biggest the smartest things I've ever done in my life, like strategically in terms of my career and my happiness have all been completely unstrategic. <laughs> They've all been like tot like writing the book review, or like I did a lot of work with someone in the early 2000s whom I met because I volunteered for a school fundraising committee. Like this stuff that um, the best stuff I've ever done has come about because of total serendipity. So that's a really good message and a really good thing to for everyone to remember. Because I think here we are in our physical bodies with our brains and we're trying to control things and put things together and really be the boss of our life. But we have to remember who's really driving this boat. <laughs> and, and I think as long as we are along for the ride in a place of presence and really seizing those, seizing those opportunities. And, and yeah, we do have some control, but, but you're right. It's like there's so many things that are just brought together for us. And if we're in the right state of mind, able to see things as they are, we can act divinely inspired accordingly and just show up and do the thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, you know, I, t I like to be very sort of business like and no nonsense and realistic. And so if, if it wasn't so clear to me that that, that works, like just total serendipity and presence works, I'd be, I'd be very embarrassed to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like you can't really, I, th I think a lot of people try and pretend like they trust the universe. Oh, I trust the universe. Oh, I trust the universe. But I think when it comes down to it, a lot of people are shit scared of the universe because they don't know what the hell is around the corner. Yeah. So it sounds like you're at a place of, wow, like I trust the universe. I really do. Well, I, th I think I'm also <laughs> shit scared of the universe, but, but it, was, it was like, you know, it was almost like I trust the universe because there's nothing at stake here. Like there's no, you know, I mean, doing the book was, was more of a risk, but writing the review was no risk at all. It was just, hey, this will be fun. And like, oh, look, this is uh, a little treasure chest opened up here. Wow. Super right. cool. I'd like to, I'd like to maybe shift gears a little bit. I know you are a health coach. I mean, that... That has been a thread that has, well, you were a coach um, with your, your friend and colleague, was it Peter Bregman? Yeah. And uh, that kind of got you in the world of coaching. And then it, and before then you were a teacher and kind of working with people and that, you know, kind of teachers are a coach, I, I think. Um, so ha like, ha and now through the health coach door, you, you've kind of created this health coaching academy where you're kind of coaching coaches. 
Uh huh. So tell tell me more about about the world of coaching and and what you feel like are some of the important skills or characteristics that you feel like a good coach brings to the table. Mm. Well, so first thing is that the people we tend to be coaching um, at WellStart, um, most of them come because they want to change. So there's there's a whole field of health coaching that's sort of clinical, which is like a, you'd have a health coach as part of a health plan or part of a hospital, and they would deal with people who don't want to change, right? Mm -hmm. So the doctor goes in and says, well, look, you know, you've got diabetes now, you're 45 pounds overweight, you've got high blood pressure, you've got high cholesterol. Um, there's, there's an understanding in the world now that there might be better options than just medicating. I mean, it's a small, it's a small slice of the world right now understands that, well, you could do something, you know, do something about your diet, you can move more, you can try to re you know, reduce stress, improve your sleep, all that stuff. But now we can't just prescribe pills, we got to get people to change. So there's a whole part of what's called health coaching that's actually motivational interviewing, which is kind of getting people in touch with why they might want to do this thing that they really don't want to do. Mm -hmm. like, so, so you're saying that the, most of the coaching that you're doing is not that. Correct. Not influencing people to change their behavior. We are, to, I mean, to some extent, but we're not, it's, um, the way I think about it is motivational interviewing. It's like if you're a, a dog trainer and you want to do, you know, to train dogs to, you know, to do tricks and be obedient, the first thing you got to do is drag the dog through the door into your clinic. <laughs> That's motivational interviewing, right? But you, they still don't know how to sit and roll over and play dead, <laughs> right, or heal. Mm -hmm. So like that's coaching. Mm -hmm. So we do, we do some, but mostly I don't focus on the motivation part. One of the insights that I got from Peter Bregman is that we try to, th we, we think everything is a motivation problem. And, and so we apply these motivational tools. So someone will come in and they want to, you know, improve the way they eat to lose weight. And we'll explain to them, you know, let's say they've read whole. And they, you know, come to me and like, oh, I get it. It makes so much sense. I want to do it. I say, great. So let's come up with a plan. They go home. Two weeks later, they come back and they say, oh, I didn't do it. I, you know, I kept on getting tempted. We went out to eat four times. So the the inclination is to remotivate them. Okay. Well, let's. What's your big why? What do you want to achieve in the future? Remind me why that's important to you. All right. And so, so Peter's insight is that motivation is a thinking problem. Right, that if we're not motivated, it's because our thinking is not aligned with a goal. But he says, what happens when we're not, we don't do something, it's not about motivation, it's about follow through. And they're very different things because motivation is about thinking and follow through is about not thinking. So if you think about the things that you follow through on, you don't think about them, right? The goal is to just do them. So I don't know if you, you know, you, you, yesterday on the, on my podcast, you mentioned doing a lot of like ice water and cold water stuff. And the way you smiled when you talked about it, I think you kind of enjoy it. <laughs> I'm smiling again now. It's like, <laughs> Ooh, a good ice bath. Yeah. Right. But I'm imagining there were some mornings, like you might not have wanted to get out of bed and go, you know, do some cold ice thing or do some hard yoga or, or whatever you do in the morning. That there are mornings you're like, oh God, I just want to sleep in. Right. You, you got that you right. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> right. So if we're dealing with motivation, then you're laying in bed thinking, why do I want to do this? What's the value? Does it? How does it? Well, eh, is there a different? Eh? Whereas if we're doing follow through, you're just like, I'm a zombie. I'm getting up. I I don't want to. I go do the thing. I go do the other thing. It's non-negotiable. It's not something that I think about. It's just something that I have decided that I do. And so, so I'm trying to, you know, I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around what you're kind of pointing to. It's so rather than focusing on the motivation, which is like mustering up this, this clarity and this courage and, and, and like thinking about doing it, it's like skipping that and just going directly to the action. Yeah. And then we say, well, so why, what are the skills you need in order to, to take different new actions and to make them sustainable. And behavior change is a skill. People think of it like, oh, you know, they, I'm wondering if you get this all the time. You, tell, you might be telling someone like how you live and how you eat, and they go, oh, I could never do that. 
Uh, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have the willpower for that. And yeah. you're like, my life takes zero willpower. Yeah, let me tell you something. It ain't hard, right? Yeah. Right. So people think that the reason they can't do it is they're lazy, they're unmotivated, they have no willpower, they have no self-discipline. And that's, you know, that's like, do you play a musical instrument? I don't. That no. is my one not doing oh. thing in this world. Oh, I, here, I, I just yeah. dug the knife right in. Oh, yeah. I know. I wish. I'm a, I, de yeah. I desire to. Maybe, maybe it's too, too calm in the future. Okay. Well, so I'll, I'll keep pushing this metaphor. Um, did you learn how to play a sport as a kid? Played baseball. Baseball. Okay. So when you were a little kid and you couldn't catch a baseball, you had to go through a period of not being able to catch a baseball until you could catch a baseball, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so imagine, um, you know, I'll, I'll be stereotypical, a dad taking his seven-year-old out into the backyard to teach him how to throw a baseball, to catch a baseball. Dad throws the baseball, it bounces off his mitt or chin or whatever. And the dad mm -hmm. says, and the kid says, oh, I'll never, be, I'll never be able to do this. And the dad says, yeah. You, you're just not self-disciplined enough. As opposed to, this is a skill that I have to practice in order to master, and I'm gonna make lots of mistakes, but what I do, and when, with baseball, it's a really good example, is every time the ball comes in and it misses, I pay attention to how it misses. Right? Oh, it, you know, I had my thing here, it bounced here, it went down. And it's like, you know, cybernetically, we learn how to adjust in order to achieve this goal. And that's exactly how people learn to do anything. And it's also how we learn to create new food habits, new movement habits, new mindset habits, is by practicing. And so all we are doing as coaches is enabling people to take the drama out of it, assess the situation realistically, and with through feedback, do new things until they start getting the results they want. Got it. What I really hear you saying is shifting the perspective at which we look at the behavior change as just an opportunity to maybe fail, learn a lot, refine a skill, and just, you know, rather than, it's like, rather than a do or don't do, it's like a learn, a process, yeah. not an event. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, the, the biggest thing, like I, I um, in my early 20s, learned how to juggle pretty well. And, and I started teaching juggling. And what I noticed that pe people who did not do well, when they were trying to learn, every time they dropped it, they'd get a little bit mad. <laughs> like, <clears throat> you can see the, the, the micro expression. And the people who did really well, were like, huh, oh, huh. Yeah. oh look, you know, look where that one went. <laughs> right. So to, to just remove the drama from it, and, and, and there's a lot more drama around eating badly than dropping a beanbag, <laughs> right? Because we have so much guilt and shame around food and around body that a lot of coaching is just sort of, you know, removing the poison that, uh, that our society injects in us and letting yeah. people simply be matter of fact about it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, another thing I hear you kind of saying is having sort of a beginner's mindset, which I know is a powerful place to live from and just being curious, being open and receiving feedback more neutrally rather than emotionally. And, uh, you know, I think that's uh, a practice. And um, yeah, we talked about life as a practice. And I think that's a great way to relate to any sort of behavioral change or any other aspect of life. I do have one thing that's coming up for me. It's like a, a yeah, but that's okay. coming up for me. Cool. Is, uh, <clears throat> you know, but food and other habits that may be self-sabotaging with regard to health is so enjoyable. And like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, but I can't enjoy that. Like, so how do you factor in the joy enjoyment factor? Ah, so be beautiful question. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we tell people is that when you improve your diet, it will not taste as good as your old diet. What? <laughs> what do you? So I do. So I am gonna suffer. Yes. So this does suck. 
Yes, you. Yes, in order. Like, when was the last time you achieved something worthwhile without sacrifice? Mm. Right. Like, be okay with that. Be now. I mean, the truth is, you and I both know that we enjoy our food now much more than I don't know if you know if you you know popped out of the womb vegan and whole plant based. <laughs> whether you have a, a sort yeah. of history like the rest of us. Yeah. Um, I was bit by the bug a couple times too, but anyway. Yeah. Okay. We'll, start, we'll, we'll, we'll start a support group of recidivist yeah. vegans. Um, yeah, like, you know, we, we in, in the vegan community, we want to appeal to people. We want to do good marketing. So our Instagrams and our YouTubes and our Facebooks are full of these beautiful things. Like what I eat, if, I, if I've Instagrammed my food, you'd be like, is this going in or coming out? It's like, is this for the dog or what? Yeah, yeah. So like brown slop, you know, like, yeah. oh. <laughs> you know, like be okay with, with not getting all of your dopamine from your taste buds, <laughs> right? And maybe when you do, when you, when you leave room, then you'll discover how miserable you are <laughs> and you'll make some other useful changes in your life. Wow. Yeah, something just clicked inside of me, just how a lot of people are reliant on nasty stuff for their feel good, feeling good. It's like, oh my gosh, if we take that out, then people have an opportunity to feel good naturally. Yeah, it's it's like, and there's, oh. there's space yeah. to realize that, oh, I have been emotionally self-sabotaging my life or I have been putting up with things that I don't need to put up with. Like there's, you know, like I don't, we don't, in coaching, we really don't do any sort of deep psychological healing, but very often when people learn how to say no to hyper palatable junk food, they then get in touch with past trauma and it starts bubbling up and what you can yeah. feel, you can heal. Yeah, that's cool. I really, yeah, thank you for entertaining the coaching conversation. I, it seems like you really ha do have a knack for it. And it's cool that you're training coaches like all over the world or wh how, what, what, where are the coaches that yeah. you're training through Wellstart? Well, uh, we, we have had um, three international. Uh -huh. So uh, there are people who get up at weird hours to take part in coach training. So have, hats off to them. We've had a couple in the UK and, and, and one in Australia. Uh, actually, no, we had four. We had one in uh, Mozambique. Wow. So, cool. um, <laughs> yeah. So international, you know, in a certain sense. It's like so, so cool. when, I, when I was doing internet marketing, one, one of uh, my teachers told me that the, de the definition of an internationally recognized celebrity is someone who sees a friend in the Toronto airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do like to throw out their internationally recognized this, that, or the other. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so say one more thing about jo joy. Oh, uh, please say as much as you'd like about joy. Which is so that you know, the problem, the essential problem of behavior change is that the behavior that we want to stop doing feels good now. And the benefit of stopping that behavior or replacing it is in the future. And so there's this whole concept in behavioral economics called either present bias or future discounting which is essentially that whatever's going on now feels much more significant and important to us than whatever could be happening in the future. So, you know, those was like, it'll, the thought of being ripped and lean and healthy next summer is like, it is much smaller than the annoyance of getting out of bed and going to the gym today. And so the, so the uh, like the, the math doesn't really work. And so there's all these techniques, like people talk about bundling, like, okay, so I can only watch uh, Game of Thrones when I'm on my stationary bike, or after I go to yoga, I will treat myself to a massage if I go three times a week, right? So it's, I'm going to give myself a reward to try to um, restat, you know, re-level because the present yeah. thing is so horrible and the future benefit is so far away. So, yeah. so we've come up with a different methodology for that, which, uh, which I, I got the language and the concept from Dan Ariely, who's a professor at Duke University. And the phrase he uses is benign masochism. And he was really interested in cultures like CrossFit, where, did you ever do CrossFit? No, but it is benign masochism, isn't it? It's people like bragging about how bad the workout was. 
right about, about or, how or, yeah and you're an ultra marathoner yeah yeah same I mean, thing. that's another another world like oh yeah i just you know <laughs> ran 400 miles and <laughs> right i'm so happy with how bad it sucked yeah and what occurred to us was and i got a little also a little of this from doug lyle from his uh, esteem dynamics work is that doing hard things builds self-esteem and so what we can do instead of seeing benefit in the future of doing a hard thing, you can actually enjoy how much you don't enjoy it. You can actually consciously, again, it's another mindset thing, you can take pride in fighting through this thing, in jogging from one lamppost to another when you're going to feel sucky and out of breath. And, and so not having to wait for a future benefit, but being proud of how much you aren't enjoying it. And it's an amazing mental jujitsu. And, and almost everyone I know who is successful at whatever they do has done this jujitsu, whether it's in business or to become a naturopath. I'm sure you, I'm sure you have to work really hard. Mm -hmm. And if you don't enjoy not enjoying it, you're not going to make it through. Yeah, you brought up a, a couple of really wonderful terms that I have never heard of before, one of which is the benign masochism. The other one was the behavioral economics and how it needs to, you know, balance in our consciousness. And yeah, as you're talking about it, I'm, I'm realizing that all of these things have are part of my life. I do enjoy a good struggle. I feel good, right? Like I think, I think we all do. I don't know anyone who doesn't persevere through a challenge and feel better on the other side of it. But when we look at that challenge from this side without understanding benign masochism or behavioral <laughs> economics, um, it's like, no freaking way am I going to go that way. I'm going to take the easy route. Yeah, and, and I think a big difference is whether you feel like you're a victim or a volunteer. So a lot of people, almost everyone, when they think about losing weight, eating better, they use have-to language, right? Yeah, I, got, I need to do this. Yeah, I got to get to the gym. Yeah, I really should give up sugar. Right, so they're being dragged along, and it's almost like they're 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 being forced to do it, or now they've decided to do it and they go out to eat, and all of a sudden, oh, we've all gone to Cheesecake Factory and look at the menu, and now I've been like mugged by <laughs> by some food I don't want to eat anymore. And the benign masochism piece is really about empowerment, saying I like there's a big difference between being in a sucky situation because you have no choice and signing up for a tough mutter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, like if you volunteer for it, you're like, yeah, this is, um, you know, this is why I'm here. Um, which, yeah, which reminds me, you know, uh, I, the other day when, when I was on your podcast, I talked a little bit about Vipassana meditation. And every time I've taken a Vipassana course, it's like, I signed up for this? What the like, heck? Like 10 days, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just like, what the heck was I smoking when I signed up to sit here for 14 hours a day for 10 days. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, sometimes we do sign up for the struggle. And I think in the greater context, the universal scheme, we signed up to experience our life. And uh, we are gifted opportunities to evolve and grow. And yeah. that's what it's all about. Yeah. See, I wish I believed that more. And the reason I know I don't yet is because I have a mantra about it. Like anytime we need a mantra, it's like we're trying to convince ourselves. So uh, what I realized- what's your, Yeah, what's your mantra first? So, so well, remember why, you know, yeah. I said I wanted to be a left fielder for the Yankees. The reason I didn't is the first time I ever played baseball, and I was a great softball player. I was like one of the best softball players that my little Jewish summer camp ever <laughs> produced. <laughs> And, you know, it was slow pitch and the ball was big and fat and the bats were long and I was lefty and the, I could hit it over the basketball court, you know, three, four home runs a game. But then I'm like, well, baseball couldn't be that hard. First time ever playing, pay, playing baseball, I get hit on the tibia by the first pitch. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, it's fast. It's, I couldn't, I swung, you know, okay, no. Yeah. I and mean, I, I, I just, I just felt the tibia bruise. Yeah. I still have it. I still can see the little indentation there. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, I'm never doing that again. And my, so my mantra, which I came to in my forties is batter up. Like I got hit by that pitch because I wanted to be there. Mm. 
Like it wasn't, I wasn't like, you know, standing by the swings and someone threw a baseball at my tibia. I was there, I was, I was holding a bat, I was in a crouch, I had a helmet and I got hit in the leg, batter up. So that's, that's kind of how I try to remind and convince myself that I have volunteered for all of this. Yeah, batter up. That's a great mantra. <laughs> <laughs> Matter up. That's really short and sweet to the point. Oh, I love that. Um, well, kind of wrapping things together here, um, you know, I'd like to maybe learn a little bit more about Wellstart and, and uh, how this organization is serving individuals and more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, like, how, what's, the, what's the short and sweet pitch of, of Wellstart? What, what is it and how does it help the world? <laughs> So it's a it's short, but not necessarily sweet. It's a, a digital therapeutic, which is to say a program full of bits and bytes that helps people get better. Um, it's, in, it's intensive lifestyle modification. So we're looking for people who, are, who wanna make a big change. So we're not a wellness program, despite our name. So it's not like the one you, your, your employer or your health plan will offer to like use the stairs instead of the elevator and, and drink more water. We are about intensive, significant lifestyle change, but slowly, one step at a time, skill-based approach. But we're aiming for transform transformative behaviors to leading to transformative health outcomes. Um, so we work with people who want to lose a lot of weight, reverse type 2 diabetes, reverse high cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, um, autoimmune conditions, you know. So it's a 12-week intensive program followed by an additional nine months of support, and people can really stay as long as they want. So there's, um, you know, it's, and it's a behavior change curriculum. So every day there's a video lesson. There is texting with your coaches on a, on a, on a daily basis, uh, private coaching, private texting, um, group, we're, we're on Zoom here. So imagine, you know, 15 or 20 people together on a Zoom call, it looks like, you know, old Hollywood squares. And we work with people on specific issues. There's a forum. Um, we have, um, we give out blood pressure cuffs and scales that are Bluetooth and then connected to the platform so we can actually see results rather than just have people self-report, oh, I did good this week, right? So, you know, I find the, the, just as an aside, the people who say, oh, I did good this week are always lying. Like when they use that tone of voice, like, oh, I did good. Like, okay, yeah, that's that good. Yeah. And, yeah, the that good. And the people who do the opposite are also lying. Like, oh, I totally messed up this week. You know, then we dive into it. It's like, yeah, this one time I had, you know, three oranges and stuff. Right. So I've, so I've learned how human beings put spins on things, but, but having, having the data means that we can have real conversations about, okay, this is what you said you wanted to accomplish. Let's see how you're doing. It's, it's very businesslike. So one, you know, one of the benefits of my business training is I can talk about objectives and key results, key performance indicators. Um, you know, so a lot of people who are in the business world, just most, most people have jobs and, you know, get, get uh, evaluated on metrics it's very um, comfortable to apply that to health. People just haven't thought to do it. Very cool. So this is for individuals? Yeah, we have three, three main audiences. So we, we have a, um, a program for individuals, and we start them roughly every two weeks. So you'll be in a cohort of somewhere between 10 and 30 people, depending on the, how popular it is that week. Um, and it, um, individuals can just go to wellstarthealth.com and read about it and, and sign up. We also work with employers. So we've got a few employers that we are working with to identify their basically most expensive 20% of the population who have diseases that we can do something about. Right. And, you know, you know, if people come to you with, uh, with like MS, you know how much those drugs are a year. You know, if you can help them get off, that's like 60,000 bucks a year. So we're, we're really cheap. Um, yeah. And we do, we, not, we also do live immersions, like an, a day and a half. We'll come to the company on, on their campus and work with people for a day and a half, do our uh, partly dog and pony show, but also partly, it's, it's like TED Talks and then behavioral application. So it's not just a bunch of PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we work with health plans who, and there's a, there are more and more health plans who realize that they can make more money by keep, keep, keeping people well. And health so, plans, what, what do you mean by health plans? 
Like uh, if you have a, if you're covered by, you know, Aetna, Cigna, Blue Shield. Like an insurance. Insurance. Yeah. Insurance companies uh, yeah. who yeah. like, oh, if we can get people to be healthier, then they won't need to spend as much on healthcare and we can keep that money. Yeah. I mean, you're doing the work that is absolutely essential to point the needle in a different direction when it comes to, uh, you know, the system. And you have on your, one thing that I really appreciate on your, your bio is shaking up healthcare. Because I think that as we shake it, things rattle, things break, and those are the good things that need to break. And then we can reestablish something that, that works. So it sounds like WellStart is part of that new solution. Yeah. And actually, we, you know, we get a lot of referrals from lifestyle medicine practitioners, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you and lifestyle medicine doctors and chiropractors and things like people like that, you have an expertise around diagnosing, treating, guiding and not necessarily want to spend an hour, you know, a week with a patient getting them to do the things. So a lot of physicians find us as, um, you know, sort of a, a helpful arm of, okay, now they know what to do. I will, I will monitor their blood pressure. I will monitor their, their health results, you know, titrate their meds as necessary, but like you guys teach them how to do it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, you've got your, hands and a lot of things and they've been in a lot of things throughout your life and you've got a lot of uh, fun hobbies and um you know I, i'm i'm amazed at how focused we were able to keep this conversation considering all the things that you have going on in your life but it's been such a, a wonderful conversation and such a cool story of how you evolved and went with the winds through the amazon review and the authoring and the colin campbell and the coaching and yeah, yeah it's just been a, a fun journey with you. Yeah, it's fun to be asked about it, to be able to sort of look back and make sense in retrospect. Because yeah. like right, right now, you know, I, feel, I, I always feel like I'm at some sort of crossroads. And right now I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> so <laughs> That's a good place to be. Stay there, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I've always been there. But, but <laughs> like, you know, looking back 5, 10, 15 years, it starts to make sense. So you, you've helped me, you know you know, get, get a little more trust in the universe that we're, you know, the instability that I am right now is, uh, is generative of something. Batter up. Batter up. <laughs> well, where, where can people uh, find you? What's the best place to connect in the world digitally? Uh, Obviously, wellstarthealth.com. Is that it? Wellstarthealth.com. If you're, uh, if you're interested in, you know, getting some help for, with a lifestyle change, uh, plantyourself.com is where the podcast lives. And probably the easiest way for people to, to enter the scary world of my brain is, so my business partner, Josh Lajani, who lost 230 pounds and he came, was on the cover of Runner's World and he's the, the other head coach at Wellstart, he and I wrote a book called Sick to Fit. And it's, it's available for free as an Amazon Kindle download. Awesome. And it's basically the Wellstart curriculum, whatever we could do in book form that wasn't sort of integrate, you know, interactive and hands-on and cohort-based. So for people who don't, can't afford or don't need a program, this was kind of the, uh, the blueprint for how Josh turned his life around, um, you know, with sort of my, my little scientisms added, but basically his, his insights. And so if anyone wants to uh, just go to Amazon and pick up a copy of Sick to Fit for free, um, awesome. if, you want to leave, if they want to leave a review, I will not argue. Those are very helpful. Yeah, and maybe they'll maybe the review will get bumped up and get noticed and maybe something will happen. I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> maybe, yeah, some, somebody, will, somebody who writes a review will help me write my next book. <laughs> yeah. That, I, to, I told you we'd get, to, we'd get to my inner asshole before the end of this call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we made it there. Well, gosh, uh, Howard Jacobson, it's been a real pleasure. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks for sharing your story and your wisdom. And uh, peace and love. And until next time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. <laughs>